So let's look at the trig functions and how on earth we perform calculus on them. I'm going to start with uh, an idea of limits, because you remember first principles involves limits. Uh, so let's look at our trig. Well, sine x as x approaches zero, if you think of the graph, clearly that approaches zero. Uh, cos x would uh, approach one and tan x would approach zero. So there's our three trig ratios. What happens as x approaches zero? Uh, some of those will come in handy for what we need to do. Uh, circle, by the way, in case you're wondering. Circle. What I'm going to do is I'm going to trap the area of that sector. So the sector AOC, we've got a formula that'll work that out. X, remember, is in radians, uh, and I'm making the radius as a circle one. Now, if I was to join A and C with a chord, then that triangle must be less than the area of the sector. Uh, but if I was to create a right angled triangle, so I draw in the tangent, we know the tangent's perpendicular to the radius, so we create a right angled triangle, uh, then that area must be greater than the sector. Then with a little bit of trig, we can work out that the length of AB must be the, the tan of whatever the angle X is. So let's sub that in. Well, the uh, inside triangle, half AB sine C, so now it's half 1, 1 sine X. Inside there, we've got the sector, half R squared theta. So this one, half 1 squared X. And then the right angle triangle, half base times height. So we get a half of 1 times tan x. So there's a little bit of cancelling there because they've all got a half. So x must be in between sine x and tan x. Now if I rewrite that by dividing everything by sine x. Now why do that? Well, because now I can rewrite it again. Sine x on sine x is 1. Tan x on sine x becomes 1 on cos x. And in the middle I'll just keep x on sine x. Because I'm interested in what's going to happen as x approaches 0. Now, as x approaches zero, well, the left-hand side's going to stay as one. But the right-hand side, well, we just saw, cos x approaches one, so it's also going to be one. So I have trapped x on sine x in between one and one. So logically, that's the limit. So the limit as x approaches zero of x on sine x uh, is equal to one. Also known as the small angle theorem. And what it means is for small angles, and we talk about radians here, for small angles, the sine of the angle is the same as the angle itself. Because that's what that's basically saying. X on sine X is 1. So it's known as the small angle theorem. So we might get a question like this. Well, okay, let's find the limit as X approaches 0 of 5X on sine 5X. Well, it's 1. So long as the angle, it's the key is the angle. The angle is 5X. So the bit of algebra on the top, the other side of the fraction bar, the vinculum, uh, has to be the same as, as the angle. So that's fine, that's one. So if I get something like that, x on sine 3x, the angle is the key. 3x, oh geez, I don't have that. So I'll make it 3x, that means I've got to balance it out by a third. I know that the 3x on the sine 3x is going to go to one, therefore that whole limit must be a third. So using that, let's go back to sine x. We want to know how to differentiate it, and we're going to go back to first principles. That's why I wanted this limit as h approaches zero in this case. So it's going to be sine x plus h minus sine x all over h. Okay. Now if I sub in zero at this stage, it's no good because I'll get sine x minus sine x, which is zero. Zero over zero, no good. So let's expand out the sine, sine cos cos sine. I'm going to break this fraction up a bit, all right? Because remember that limit we just found was sine uh, well, it's x on sine x, but it could equally be the other way around as well. So if I look at this, um, what have I got? If I factorise out cos x, well, there's only one thing with cos x there, but I get that limit that I know the answer to, sine h on h. Now, that leaves me with a sine x, uh, cos h minus 1 over h. That bit's still no good. Uh, because, well, cos would approach 1, 1 minus 1, 0. I've still got 0 and 0. But at least I've got the first bit there. So I'm going to play around with the second one. And I'm going to use double angles. So cos h becomes 2 cos squared h on 2 minus 1. But then minus the other one that I've got there becomes minus 2. All right, I now have cos squared h on 2. I want to get that limit into it. All right. Well, cos squared minus 1 is sine squared. 
So I now have 2 sine squared h on 2 over h. So now what shall I do? Remember the limit we knew was not sine squared, but sine. So I'll rewrite that. Sine h on 2 on h on 2, and it'll be times sine h on 2. Now it's fine, because I know the sine h on 2 on the h on 2, that's going to approach 1. And then when I sub it into the sine h on 2, well, that's going to be sine of 0, which is 0. Okay? So the first bit, the sine h on h approaches 1. The sine h on 2 on h on 2 also approaches 1. But this, just the sine h on 2 by itself approaches 0. So we end up with cos x times 1 plus sine x, cosine x. In general, sine of function x, you want to differentiate the sine of function x? You differentiate the angle. So that derivative goes out the front, the sine function becomes a cosine function. Now let's try one for cosine, but now we know how to differentiate sine, it becomes a bit easier. Because I can rewrite cosine uh, we're using complementary ratios. Remember, it has to be radians. So it's sine pi on 2 minus x. But I can differentiate that now differentiate the function, we get negative 1. So the sine goes to cosine, the angle does not change. Well, the complementary ratio to cosine is sine, so we get minus sine x. Very easy to confuse, but sine goes to cosine, cosine goes to minus sine. So to generalize that one, cosine function x, you differentiate the angle, and then it's minus sine. The cosine goes to minus sine. Well, we've done sine and cos. Got to complete the set. But we now know how to do sine and cos. So I can rewrite tan as sine on cos. <laughs> we now get to play with the question rule. Square the bottom. Right, right down, down the bottom. Down dip the, the top. top. Minus. Right down, right down the top. top. <laughs> the <bottom>. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> on the top of the fraction. All right, so on the top of the fraction, we end up with uh, cos squared plus sine squared, which is, of course, 1. Reciprocal of cos is sec. So differentiate tan, you get sec squared. So differentiate tan, again, differentiate the angle. Derivative goes to the front, and the tan changes to sec squared. All right, let's do some examples. Derivative is 3x squared. Sine goes to cos. The angle does not change. The tan of 1 on x. <laughs> Differentiate 1 on x. Well, hopefully we've done enough times to know that just goes straight to minus 1 on x squared. So we get minus 1 on x squared, sec squared, 1 on x. The log of cos x. So it's actually a log function we're differentiating. How do we differentiate a log function? Derivative on function. The derivative of what? Well, in this case, it's the derivative of cos x. Differentiate cos x, you get minus sine x on the function, it's cos x. So I have minus sine x on cos x, which is minus tan x. So the derivative of the log of cos x is minus tan x. Tan to the power of 5, it's, it's a situation of our chain rule because we're really saying tan x all to the power of 5. So bring down the power, 5. Lower the power, 4. Diff the inside, the inside's tan x. Differentiate tan x, you get secant squared. Six squared. <laughs> so we get five times ten to the power of four x. Six squared x. Cos e to the power of x. Cosine. The function is e to the power of x. Let's differentiate the angle. The angle is e to the power of x. Differentiate e to the power of x. We get. Okay. Cosine goes to. And now. Minus e to the x, sine e to the x. <laughs> 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 <laughs>